right, let's sing this together. He's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. The kings and kingdoms will bow down. So open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord? Oh, my. together who can stop who can stop the Lord Almighty 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 come on let's declare that who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Come on, who can? Kingdom. 
chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, we're going to begin reading at verse 25. We just had a chance to worship with our voices, and singing to God in Scripture is not a holy suggestion. It's actually a command that we are, we are called on to praise God because He's worthy. Well, now we're going to have a chance to worship by paying attention to what He said. In, in, you see this a lot in the Old Testament where God assigns a huge value to what he said, where people, they disobey God, and he tells them not that they've just despised his word, but that they have despised him by disobeying what he said, by not regarding what he said. And so God attaches his identity to what he said. So let's listen carefully now as, as we read this, and then as Pastor Mark proclaims God's word. Verse 25, it says, Then an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he asked him. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, he told them. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, 
he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, on his journey, came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, Go and do the same. Well, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you. You are one God. You live together and reign together in wisdom and unity and love and in joy. Lord, you didn't need us. You were fulfilled before time began. But yet, out of the overflow of that goodness, you made us to see that and to enjoy it, to share it with one another. But Lord, we have turned against you. We have fallen as individuals and as humanity. Lord, we deserve your judgment. That would be good and right. And you are just, Lord, but you are overflowing with mercy. Lord, you love to have compassion, to come and meet the broken. Lord, thank you for sending your son Jesus, and we could sing his praises this morning. Lord, we don't just sing because we like music. You've told us, you've commanded us to, and Lord, our hearts want to, to express that worth back to you, to encourage one another with these truths. Pray that you would use your word this morning to expose our hearts, to show what is, what is there. Turn us from our sin, Lord. Turn us out towards our neighbor to love them, people in our family, in our church, and in the world around us where there is brokenness. Lord, I pray that we would look to meet that brokenness with meeting tangible needs and also with the good news about Jesus. Pray for those who have who are here today who have not turned from their sin, who are still under its rule and its power, God, open their eyes and, and let them look to Jesus to be made whole, to be free and forgiven. Thank you that you hear us when we call to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben, for reading the Word. And what a joy and privilege it is to study God's Word and understand from it how we are to live our lives. We've been in a series entitled Radical Impact, A Life Worth Living. We've been studying this incredible entrustment that God has given to us to make disciples. Uh, we've looked at it in detail, and I think we understand it. Uh, but really what I want us to grasp in the weeks ahead is if we really believe this, and we're going to really love God and love people. How do we do it? How do we implement the truth that we know? I've chosen two passages, very familiar passages, that I want us to break down and really understand and look at that help us grasp the practicality, the steps of application, and, and taking this entrustment that God's given us and taking it out there and living it. The two texts I've chosen, one is the Good Samaritan text that we just had a chance to read as Ben was reading that to us. The other will be the woman at the well where Jesus encountered this lady. Both of these really challenge us to see the practical steps that we can live. The whole deal is simply this. How do we move from knowing the truth to living the truth? That is the great challenge. In fact, the man in the text here today, this expert in the law, this was his great challenge. And Jesus interacts with him in a very loving way. He could have put him in his place. He could have put him down, but he does not. He is leading him to an understanding that this is a man who knows the truth, but is struggling to live the truth. That was his great challenge. That is our great challenge. We've got to overcome it. And I want us to start in these texts so that we can move from knowing it to living it. 
And to do that, I want us to see four facts that we should consider that this man was going through in this, this challenge that he was having. Four facts to consider. We're going to see that there was an internal struggle. We're going to look at the final authority. We're going to look at the knowing versus the doing, and then the lure and the power of self-justification. And in these four things, we really want to take time to understand them so that it can change us on the inside. And as it changes us on the inside, it's going to change how we live our lives. So I want to begin with the first of these four facts to consider, and that is the internal struggle. This is verse 25, and here's what it says. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is a very short verse but it speaks volumes to us about this man who is an expert in the law. What does that mean? What that simply means is here's a man who knows the truth. He was a teacher of truth. Can we relate to him? I think the answer to that is yes, we can. I think we know the truth. In fact, we've been studying it over the last several months. We understand the truth. Uh, we've been exposed to it. Here was a man who knew the truth. But there was something about Jesus' life. He was a man. He was the God-man. He was the Savior of the world. He was teaching truth. He taught with authority. He lived with authority. People were drawn to him. And as he was teaching and living the truth, it had an obvious effect upon this man's life. It was unsettling this man, this expert in the law. That's why he comes with a question, to do what? To test Jesus. This man was experiencing spiritual tension within his heart. We know this from the context. We call this conviction. And if you're feeling conviction, don't fight it. Let the Lord do His work within you. If He is pricking your conscience, if He is convicting you by His Word, that there ought to be a change in your life, this is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's an evidence that God is working in your life. This man was experiencing spiritual tension, and he was fighting against it instead of letting God do his work within his heart. You say, well, what was this man's issue? I'll tell you what his issue was. This is a man who is struggling with authority. His intent was to test Jesus, not trust Jesus. That's an authority problem. It doesn't say this expert in the law was a man who had a problem with authority. The Scripture doesn't say that. But the context tells us that. Because he is coming to test Jesus. We do the same things many times. We come to test instead of trust. This was a man who wanted to make it about performance. And Jesus said it's not about performance. It's about love. We know that from the context. Obedience is based on love for God. It's not based on keeping spiritual laws. It's not based on my performance so that I can impress Jesus or I can impress God and I can put down a slate of, uh, of obedience that says, man, you've got to pay attention to me. Look how good I am. It's not about that. But here's a man who wants it to be about that. This whole deal is about really coming under the authority of Jesus. Did you know when we come under the authority of Jesus, we have something the Scripture teaches which is called kingdom authority? Did you know you have kingdom authority when you submit and surrender to Jesus? It is given to every believer. Most of us never realize how much authority we really have in the name of Jesus, in our relationship with Jesus. We have a heavenly authority. But there is also something that is directly connected to us that tells us whether we are tapping into that heavenly authority in Jesus, and that is the fact that He also gives us earthly authorities in our lives. And how we respond to earthly authorities determines how we are responding to our heavenly authority, which is Jesus. Sometimes people get these confused. We try to go out and exercise our heavenly authority, say, well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to be a witness for the Lord and I'm going to be effective, I'm going to win people to Jesus. And we go out knowing the truth, but we go out 
without the power that we need. We don't really have the kingdom authority that we need because we've not truly, fully surrendered to Jesus as we should. We're more committed than we are surrendered, and we'll talk about that. And we go out and we fail, and we wonder why. And then sometimes we don't even have the desire to do what God has asked us to do, and we wonder why. There is something to this earthly authorities in which God has given us. If we can't fully embrace those, for example, in the home, in a marriage, in a work relationship, whatever it is, the authority that God has placed over us here on earth, what it says to us is simply this. I have not accepted where God has placed me. And when you say I've not accepted where God has placed me, what you're saying is I don't accept the mission field in which you've placed me. And if I can't come under the authority in which you placed over me on this earth, I'm really in conflict with my heavenly authority, which is Jesus, because I've not accepted my earthly spot in which God's placed me. So there's something to this coming under the earthly authorities in which God's given us that is connected with coming under the authority of Jesus. And when we come under the authority of Jesus, then we're able to come under the earthly authorities in which God's given us. And when we're under the earthly authorities that God has given us, which is an indication that we're under the heavenly authority of Jesus, then our earthly opportunities to have an eternal impact uh, are there. If not, we waste them. Because we come under the earthly authorities and we rebel. We have bad attitudes. We don't like them. Uh, we speak against them. We're not praying for them. We, uh, we are restless. Uh, we push back against we don't live with a burden for them. We don't come to serve under them. We're not praying for them. We're not seeking an opportunity to speak truth to them. Instead, we have a spirit of rebellion against them. And it, and it shows. It can be felt by others. It is watched by others. And you say, well, they don't treat me well. I have a right to be upset with them. We really don't. The only right we have is to come under the heavenly authority of Jesus. And when we come under his heavenly authority, it gives us the ability to come under the earthly authority that then it changes how we handle that pressure. It changes how we handle where God's placed us in life. And the spirit is one of acceptance. It's one of trust to God and saying, God, here's where you've placed me. I want you to use me here in a way that will honor you. So, Grasp this, if you would. I'm speaking about this earthly authority, whether it's coming under the authority in your home, whether it's coming under authority at your work, and maybe it's coming under your civil authority. A police officer pulls you over. What is your attitude toward that? I don't know what it is. But whatever that earthly authority is, that's your mission field. See, this man, this expert in the law, he did not want to come under any earthly authority. You say, how do you know that? Because he wanted to justify himself in regards to who his neighbor was. Which was an indication he was not really willing to come under the heavenly authority of Jesus. He wanted to negotiate. And if he had a problem with who his neighbor was, he was going to have a problem in other areas of his life. We just don't know what they were. But this was a man that had a problem coming under authority. And if we are having those problems, we need to learn that we will never, listen, we will never ever be effective in winning a lost world till we understand authority, heavenly and earthly, because the two are distinctly connected. When we rebel against earthly authorities, we are rebelling against God. All of this projects our witness to others. And when people are watching us, we're either validated to speak or we're not. I've learned that I I've got to come under my heavenly authority so that I can embrace the earthly authorities that God has given me. It's only wise to live this way. I don't want my heart to be in rebellion toward authority. I want to be in a position to be a witness. I don't want to be complaining all the time. I don't want to be railing against authority. I don't want to have a spirit that's derogatory. I want to embrace where God has placed me in order to be a witness for Him. And this is, this is so key. I, I, I remember 
being in this internal struggle with God and authority that was placed over me. I think I've spoken about this. You may or may not remember this, but it's distinctly impressive upon me because when I was a 16-year-old boy, young man, got a job, had a car, wanted to make some money, get some gas money, be able to drive around, have some freedom. So I took a job at a drugstore, and I enjoyed my job there. And I had, uh, we had some pharmacists that were over us, and I had good relationships with them. But then one day, there was a pharmacist that came in that was transferred to our store. You know, uh, you know how Joseph has said, uh, there was a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph? Well, there was a pharmacist that knew not Mark. And he came into uh, this workplace, and he didn't care anything about me. In fact, he was hard on me, at least from my perspective. He didn't give me the schedule I wanted. When I wanted to work the register, he put me on the floor. When I wanted to do this, he said, go to the back room and, and do all the stock and clean the bathrooms. And I thought he was being unfair toward me. And he may have been. It didn't matter. But what happened was this. There became an internal battle within me toward this man. I didn't really know him. I didn't know how to value him. I really wasn't serving him. I just got angry with him. And my attitude toward him changed. My attitude as I worked on the floor was not a good attitude. And so when I was around other people, I didn't have a good attitude, see? And, and I'd leave there and I'd think about it all the way home. And sometimes all night long, how angry I was at that man and how he was ruining my life. But what I couldn't see was I was ruining my reputation. I was ruining my opportunities to be a witness for the Lord. Because I promise you, the people that I loved and I worked with could see that there was something different within me. There was this internal struggle. I was rebelling against an authority. And it wasn't healthy. And so I tell you this little story because, yes, my life was a witness. People were watching me. And if I couldn't come up under that earthly authority, really the issue was I was mad at God that God allowed that man to come and be over me and in my mind as a 16-year-old young man ruin my life, right? You look back and go, that's ridiculous. It was ridiculous, but it was real. And some of you today are living in situations where you are upset with the earthly authority, which is an indication you're not trusting God with who he's brought over you. You know, Joseph dealt with this. He was placed in prison. He had to deal with Potiphar's wife. He went through all kinds of things, and ultimately he had to trust that God placed him there. His life would be a witness, and in the hands of God in time, God would work it all out. And God did. But see, there's this connection between coming under God's authority and the earthly authority that is incredibly, incredibly important. And this man, I am telling you, is in this conversation with Jesus because he has an authority problem with Jesus. He doesn't want to come under it. So what's his question? He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? See, what must I do is very different than what should I be doing? Well, Jesus, what should I be doing? Not what must I do to inherit eternal life. I want to determine if I've done what I need to do. One is based on works. One is based on worship. When we're worshiping the Lord, we'll do whatever he asks us to do in a surrendered state. When it's based on works, we're going to prove to him that we are doing what we believe ought to be done. Too often we try to earn our way, impress our way into favor with God when we fail to surrender. It is a miserable place to be. Surrender is freedom. This proving, we've got to do it over and over and over again. Doing is an indication of being instead of doing in order to be. Think about that. When we come and we test the Lord, what we're saying is, what must I do? But when we come and we trust Him, what we're saying is, what should I be doing? This man really didn't have a heart to say, Lord, what should I be doing? You know what? For you and for me, we should go to the Lord and say, God, what should I be doing? I just want to serve you wherever you place me, whoever you bring into my life. But if we have an authority problem with the Lord, we're not going to look at it like that. So if we have this, how do you correct it? How could this man correct it? Well, the Lord's going to help him, and he's going to show him, and what he shows him is something that we need as well. And that is our second point that we need to look at, the second thing, and that is this, the final authority. 
the final authority. Look at verse 26. He says, what is written in the law? Jesus asked this question. What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? See, Jesus is is really these two points right here are things that we need as well, just as this man needed. Jesus sent the man back to the Word, to the law. He is, yes, an expert in the law. There's no excuse about not knowing. But he sends him back, and he also asks him, how do you read it? That means, what is your understanding? What is your interpretation? Because our understanding, our interpretation determines our actions, and our actions reflect our beliefs. We can say what we believe all day long, but if we do not live it, we we don't really believe it. And so if we know all this truth about this entrustment, about making disciples, if we never have a heart for it, we never do it, we just know about it, but we never engage it, the truth of the matter is, We know it, but we don't really believe it. So we have to move from knowing it to living it. And when we're living it, then it says we believe it. And there it is. The Bible is the final and only authority. Jesus did not ask this man who was an expert in the law. He didn't say, what do the scribes and the Pharisees say? He didn't ask, what is the tradition of the Jewish religion? He didn't ask, what's your opinion? He asked, what is written in the law? See, that's our foundation. That's what matters, what God has revealed from his heart. This is why I base my life on it. This is why I want to live by God's word. And I want to know God's word. It's powerful. And to do so is to come under his authority. His written revelation, his word. Adrian Rogers wrote these words. He said, We can never speak with authority. We can never preach with authority, witness with authority, live with authority, or serve with authority until we get under the authority of the word of God. And that's true. God's Word is the final authority. And listen, if we, don't, if we don't live this way as believers, we live based off our feelings and our opinions. And we're over here and we're over there. We're up one day and we're down the next. And we're all over the place. And then we wake up one day and go, what was this all about? Did I impact anybody for eternity? Did God work through me? And, and, and the difference is going to be whether we come under the authority of the Word and we live it, or whether we know about it and we're just here and we're there and we're everywhere. Come under His authority. Live by His Word. That's where the power is. That's where the stability is. You know, Jesus dealt with Satan's temptations by saying, it is written. And He put it in its proper context. See, it's by His Word. See, the man knew what was written. He had knowledge. We have knowledge. But the real question that lies with him is how do you read it? How do you move from exposure to execution of truth? This man wasn't doing it. The real question for me and for you is am I living by God's Word? This is why the third point is so important. We have to move from knowing versus the doing. The knowing versus the doing. Watch how this man answers. He answered this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And watch what Jesus says to this. Now that's a direct quote out of Scripture, Deuteronomy 6, 5, Leviticus 19, 8. And watch what Jesus says. You have answered correctly. It's like having a Bible quiz. Jesus asks you a question, you can answer it right from Scripture. That's what this man did. He he got it right. And Jesus affirmed that you got it right. That's good. You know what's right. But watch what Jesus says. Do this and you will live. Did you hear that? Do you realize the connection between us being exposed to this truth and us living this truth? is the difference between dead religion and a live relationship with Jesus Christ. Do this and you will live. That's powerful. He's trying to help the man. He's trying to guide the man. He's trying to direct the man into real life. This man knew what was right. Man, he struggled with doing it. Do this and you will live. You know, the school model... At least this was true for me. Maybe it's changed some. I don't know. Was we give you the content, 
You give it back to us, and if you give us all of it back correctly, you get an A+. Plus. But there was never any question about applying it in your life. If you can't recall it, you get an F. But if you recall it correctly, you get an A+. Plus. Well, this man got an A+, plus, but in application, he got an F. See, it's one thing to know the truth. It's another to live the truth. That's the difference. Truth has to change us. It has to move us. It has to, it has to pour through us the living word for us to come alive as believers. That's why he's asked this man, do this. You know what's right. You do it. Guess what happens? Then you will live. Well, what was his response to that? What, how did he deal with that? That's pretty clear, right? I mean, here's what's written. Okay, you know it. Go do it. How does the man, the expert in the law, respond? This is the lure and the power of self-justification. Verse 29. But he wanted. Are you, watch, are you looking at this verse? Does it say this? But he wanted to obey the Lord fully, so he went out and did exactly what Jesus said to do. Is that what it says? No. Here's what it says. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked another question. Remember, he's in the testing mode. He's in the proving mode. He's not in the submission mode. He's not in tell me what to do and I'll do it mode. He's in the justification mode. And so he asked a second question. He says, and who is my neighbor? I'll tell you what this man's doing. He's more interested in arguing than he is obeying the Word of God. He's trying to save faith. Face, and he's going to ask another question. Who's my neighbor? He's arguing. You know what arguing is? An argument is an attempt to convince other people of something, to prove you are right in order to get your way. Just think about how ridiculous this is. Here this man, who's an expert in the law, is arguing with the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the Creator, the one that knows everything, and he thinks he's going to win an argument with Jesus? Wait a minute now. Mark and any of any, the rest of us, when have I argued with the Lord that way? When have I seen it clearly from Scripture and came up with another perspective in another way or maybe later or I see it differently or instead of just saying, yes, Lord, I see it, I'll, I'll obey. Our, our, don't, don't we tend to be like this man who wants to justify himself? It's a real temptation. There's a lure and a power to it. Justification is simply nothing more than this. It is a redefining of Scripture to fit one's own desire. We justify our beliefs to justify our behavior. Instead, we should be adjusting to the Word, not justifying the Word to our self-desires and definitions. Obedience to the Word, that is the moment of truth where life pours through us. And we live. But there is this internal battle that we have. Really what this man was saying is, tell me who I have to love. Which means, tell me who I don't have to love. He's looking for a way out to ease his conscience. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. There's been an entrustment given to us, and it's the gospel. It's to make disciples. We know it. The real question is, will we live it? It really comes back to an authority issue. I don't know if you've ever thought about it like that, but really it comes back to an authority issue. We're more apt to commit than we are to surrender. You know, there's a big difference between commitment and surrender. Commitment means we're still in control. We may do some honorable things. We may commit to pray. We may commit to give. We may commit to attendance. We may commit to a lot of different things in life, exercise, faithfulness, whatever. But in commitment, the problem is we're still in control. And, and when it's over, we want the glory. 
That's the difference. But in surrender, we give up everything and we give all of the glory to God that he's done it and we couldn't have done it without him. There's a big difference. But God wants us to surrender. That's what he's asking this man to do, and he can't do it. He, 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 just, he just can't, he can't give up the control. If you were to rate yourself on surrender between 1 and a 10, how would you rate yourself? Right now, just in your minds, rate yourself. Would it be a 4 on surrender, 7? Maybe, maybe it's a 9. Maybe, it, maybe it's a 3. May I say to you, in your rating, whatever it was, please understand this. Surrender either is or it is not. There is no middle ground. Either you jump off the diving board or you don't. You can't kind of jump. You can't kind of have faith. You can't kind of follow Jesus. It's either you are or you are not. Here was a man who was trying to say, well, yeah, I'm in, and I know truth. Look at, you know, and he's trying to, you try to justify. Well, you can't do it. Either you're surrendered or you're not. You're living by the word or you're not. You're obeying or you're not. You're loving through your obedience or you're not. A couple years ago, there was a hiker, a lady who was hiking with a group, and she fell behind, about 20 minutes behind. She was on the Appalachian Trail with a group in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. She was up near Camel Gap, which is the eastern section of the park. And she's hiking along. She's about, she fell back about 20 minutes behind the other group, and she's by herself. There's a true story. You can look it up. I'm just telling you it's true, Okay. This is not a made-up hypothetical story. Here's this lady. She's got her backpack on, and she's hiking along. And all of a sudden, on the trail, she is hit, and she falls to the ground, and she looks up, and there's a bear. She has been hit by a bear that knocks her to the ground. And I don't know if this really happened, this part. But the bear looks at her, and he goes, hmm. What do you think about that? And he must have been full because he runs off. The bear runs off, knocks the lady, listen, knocks the lady to the ground out of nowhere on this trail. She looks up, and there the bear goes and just keeps going. She calls it in as a bear attack. And when they investigated further, what they found out was she was wearing headphones. She had no situational awareness, never saw the bear coming. She's got her music in. She's hiking along, and all of a sudden, boom. Can you imagine? Come on now. How would you handle that? Hit by a bear, and the thing kept going. Jordan Bowman of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy told, the USA, told USA Today, who was writing this article, said, situational awareness is one of the key components for safety on the Appalachian Trail. So anything that impairs one's ability to actively assess their immediate environment increases their chance of injury or getting lost. Their recommendation was don't hike with headphones on. Don't have your earbuds in. Have some situational awareness. Now, the reason I'm telling you that story is I feel like this man in our text, this expert in the law, was just like this woman. He was wearing religious headphones, and he failed to grasp the enormity of the fact that he is talking to Jesus, the Savior of the world. These religious headphones have caused him to justify himself. He knew the right thing, but he wasn't willing to live the right thing. He is literally spiritually blind and deaf, and all he wants to do is argue. And I wonder if we're much the same, that we've lost our spiritual situational awareness in life because we're not obeying the Word. We'd rather argue about the Word. We'd rather justify. And what happens is when we do that and we put those headphones on that tell us we're okay, and we're, we have something to offer, and we can prove to God that we're good, and, and we, we, we've settled that, but we don't feel like we got to obey the Word. We walk through life, and I'm telling you, lost people 
are bumping into us, knocking us down. They're getting up and, and leaving, and we don't even know what hit us. We don't even see. We don't, we, we, you can't even see the opportunity. He is going to, in this next part of this text, he is going to say to this man, listen, let me tell you a story about the good Samaritan. Let me tell you about some people that missed their opportunity because they didn't have any spiritual, situational awareness. And they all thought they were something, spiritually speaking. Man, that's dangerous. I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but God's given us this entrustment of the gospel, and I want to take it to heart. And I want to walk through life with situational, spiritual awareness. And if there's lost people God brings into my life, I don't want to miss it. I want to speak truth. And I want to have, be living truth in order to have the validity to speak truth. And for me to do those things, I am going to have to come under the authority of Jesus. And I'm going to have to come under whatever earthly authority God's given me so that my spirit, my attitude, my spiritual awareness is where it ought to be. But if I'm grumbling, if I'm griping about where I am, and I'm, and I'm upset with anybody God's placed over me, kind of like that pharmacist when I was 16, I'll be like that lady on the trail. A lost person can knock me down, and I'm going to miss it altogether. I don't want to live like that. You say, well, I don't either. Do this one thing. Come under the authority of Jesus and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. And when you do that, your spiritual awareness is so vivid, it's heightened, you're not going to miss it. You're going to obey. And as we'll see next week, you will be the good Samaritan wherever God needs you to be that. I believe that with all of my heart. Let's live the Word, not just know the Word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your loving, patient kindness with this man to explain to him, to illustrate to him, to take him back to the Word so that he could see what really matters. And in the same way, I know this morning you're doing the same with us. I don't want us to be a church that just knows we're supposed to make disciples. I want us to make disciples, Lord. I want to proclaim the truth. I don't want it just to be our history. I want it to be our present. And God, that, these are your people. This is your church, what you've called us to. And we're going to give an account to you one day. And I don't want to stand before you and argue. I don't want to stand before you and justify. I just want to stand before you and say, Lord, I can't do it without you. And anything that has been done is for your glory. I, I, I can't take any credit. And if we'd live that way, Lord, I think we'd be amazed at how you'll use us for your glory. And so that's my prayer, God. We'd just be usable, not argumentative, for your glory. Church, I'm going to ask you to stand. The altar is now open. If you would come and respond to this truth, this word, as God would lead you. Bring and give your life to the Lord fully, completely to Him. If you don't know the Lord, come. We'll be glad to talk to you about that. Contact us. We love you. God loves you. So, Father, would you work, please, here in a powerful way in this time of invitation for your glory, in the name of Jesus, amen.